Bibles with me this morning, if you would, to the book of Jeremiah. Anna mentioned it. We're going through the book of Jeremiah now in our Bible recap. And, uh, you know, as we, as we work through God's Word together, um, we're going to look at this guy who has been given an overwhelming assignment by God. Whew. Like, honestly, it's one of those kinds of assignments where I think most of us would have responded to God by saying, Hey, God, uh, thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, for real. And when you begin to read the story of, of the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 1, he, he's called by God to become a prophet when he's still young. He's a young man. And, and to put this into, uh, into perspective, uh, Jeremiah is a prophet uh, during the same time of, of young King Josiah. We talked about Josiah last week. And you'll remember that King Josiah, he, he became a king when he was only eight years old, going into the third grade, okay? And so here's Jeremiah, who becomes a prophet in the 13th year of King Josiah's reign. You do the math, it means that King Josiah is now 21 years old. He's legal, all right? Been a king now for 13 years. And Jeremiah, the prophet who we're studying today, is also young. And Jeremiah, in this stage of his young life, is really, he's just trying to come to grips with what God is about to call him to do. So here's, here's God. God says, Jeremiah, I have an assignment for you. And God says, Jeremiah, I am choosing you. I'm choosing you. Jeremiah, you're the one that I've chosen to announce to the people of Judah that because of their sins, judgment is coming. So for Jeremiah, there's, there's a lot of emotion in all of this because God's people are not willing to repent of their sinful ways of living. In fact, Jeremiah had so much sorrow, he, he, he was so overwhelmed with all of this that he became known as the weeping prophet. He was so sorrowful. So let's look at the call of, of God on Jeremiah's life. Jeremiah chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 4. And the word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Here is Jeremiah's response. He says, but I protested. Oh, no, Lord God. Look, I don't know how to speak since I'm only a youth. Then the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth, for you will go to everyone I send you to, and you will speak whatever I tell you. Do not be afraid of anyone, for I will be with you to rescue you. This is the Lord's declaration. And then the text says, the Lord reached out his hand, he touched my mouth, and he told me. I have now filled your mouth with my words. See, I have appointed you today over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and demolish, to build, and to plant. Now, I want you to think about something. I think it is remarkable that you'll remember, do you, do you remember just like Moses said to God, Lord, I'm not your guy. You all remember that? Moses, God, I'm not your guy. I, I, I don't talk so good. Jeremiah now is also protesting to God saying, oh, no, Lord, not me. I'm not, I'm not signing up for that, God. Not me, Lord. Not me, Lord. And he said the same thing. I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. I don't know what to say. And so here he is, Jeremiah, this, this somewhat insecure man at this point who's being called out by God, and I want you to notice that even in this introduction, even in Jeremiah chapter 1, we have this opportunity to learn more and more about the character of God, which is what's been so good about this Bible recap journey. We see over and over again the character of God. 
like you're like, what are you talking about, Kent? What a character of God in the opening statement? Yes. Before the Bible says, before Jeremiah was even born, God had a plan to use Jeremiah for his glory to bring about his kingdom purposes. Do you not know that God has those same kind of plans for you and for your life? He knew what he was doing and his plans for you before you were even born into this world. And so for me, when I, when I contemplate that, when I, think, when I personally think about Jeremiah's response to God, he, like full transparency, I cannot help but be reminded of the times, the many times I have said to myself and to God the very same things. The many times I have told the Lord, God, I, I just don't think I can do that. Lord, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure I'm good enough for this. Lord, I'm not talented enough. Lord, I'm not smart enough. Don't say amen on that one. <laughs> and you know, there's this powerful reminder in the book of 2 Corinthians. I'm going to jump to the New Testament for a second. Where the Apostle Paul, he's kind of talking about some of this. And the Apostle Paul, he's talking about his own sufferings, his own weakness. And, and he tells us as he writes to the church at Corinth what God has reminded him. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Look at the rest of this text. For my power is made perfect in weakness. For Moses, for Jeremiah, for the Apostle Paul, like for you and for me, for all of us, God's grace is sufficient. God always receives the most glory when we allow him to operate out of our own personal weakness. Here's what I know. God can and God will use your obedience for his glory. He will. And I want to say this. Like if you're kind of in the boat today where you regularly find yourself coming up with excuses as to why you can't serve God, that, that's not where you need to be. That, that's probably not where you want to be either. And I'm saying this. Think about it. God did not create you in his own image so that you could be the person to just stand over there and protest his plans. That was not God's intention. Instead, his plan is that you would trust and obey. Trust and obey. Well, you read the story. Jeremiah ends up being obedient to God's call on his life. Uh, as we said for the past couple of weeks, his yes was on the table uh, was this a glorious role for him to step into? No, <laughs> absolutely not. But he did it. And in so doing, Jeremiah faithfully proclaimed to the people of Judah, you must turn from your wicked and sinful ways. How'd you like to preach that sermon week in and week out? Hey, you bunch of hooligans. <laughs> Stop being dumb. Turn from your sinful and wicked ways. He preached, my friends, that same sermon for 40 years. Here's the message. Disaster's headed your way. You must repent. You must turn from your sin. And do you realize that when you read the whole book of Jeremiah, you read about his ministry, there is not a single record of, of any converts? Like, like that's rough. That is a pretty, pretty terrible record. Yet he was obedient. The people of Judah had abandoned the Lord their God and they chose to walk in sin. That was their choice. So what's Jeremiah's response? The Bible tells us he's heartbroken. He cries out to God on their behalf. And as we read through the book of Jeremiah, you'll see it. There's warning after warning after warning of God's impending judgment. 
But I don't want you to miss this. As you read the book, you will also see hope. There are also in this book reminders of God's grace. There are reminders of God's plans to reconcile his people to himself. Look at chapter 3, verse 19 with me. We'll put it on the screen, Jeremiah 3, 19. And so he says, I thought... How I long to make you my sons and give you this desirable land, the most beautiful inheritance of all the nations. I thought you will call me my father and you will never turn away from me. However, as a, as a woman may betray her lover, so you have betrayed me, O house of Israel. So this is the Lord's declaration. A sound is heard on the barren heights. Here's the sound. The children of Israel, they're weeping. They are begging for mercy. They have perverted their way. They have forgotten the Lord their God. Now look at this part of the text. So then return, you faithless children. You know, that's the beautiful thing about what we have the opportunity to do as we gather. Man, return to the Lord, the promise of his grace. So return, you faithless children, and I, look at the promise, I will heal your unfaithfulness. Here we are, coming to you, for you are the Lord our God. Will there be distractions in this world we live with? Yes, the Bible speaks of it, surely. There's falsehood that comes from the hills. There's commotion that comes from the mountains. But look how verse 23 ends. But the salvation of Israel is only in the Lord our God. There is but one God. He is our Lord, our Savior, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at the big picture, uh, you'll learn as we continue to read this week too, more of Jeremiah. Uh, while the turnaround of God's people would never happen in the days of Jeremiah, we see, as we read this, we see a picture of Israel's future repentance when her Messiah, Jesus Christ, returns in his millennial kingdom. So church, here's the promise. We have an eternal hope in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He is our King. You know, I sometimes talk to you about, I'll get all reflective as I'm thinking about and preparing for a sermon. And the same thing, of course, happened this week. I'm thinking about the life of Jeremiah. And one of the questions I, I asked myself this week was, like, do I have the kind of heart, the kind of heart like Jeremiah had for other brothers and sisters in Christ who have have like walked away from the Lord. Do I have that kind of a heart? You know, you can apply it in multiple ways. I thought to myself, like, like maybe this would relate to, to a family member who, who, who may be in a season where they're just far away from God. You know, here, here at the church during the week, it, there are people that just come in off the street. People come in, walk into our church every week uh, asking for some kind of assistance. Like, what, what kind of a heart do I have for those folks? You know, maybe it's a neighbor for you, for me. Maybe it's a coworker. <laughs> and, you know, really, you would say, Kent, if I'm gut level honest with you, whew, that person's getting on my last nerve. What kind of a heart do you have for others? And and so I want to remind you by looking at the heart of Jeremiah in this chapter. Uh, Look look at chapter 8. Chapter 8, verses 18, 21, into chapter 9. And my joy has flown away. He says, grief has just literally settled in on me. My heart is sick. Look at what he says. I am broken by the brokenness of my dear people. Broken by the brokenness of the people around you. He says, I mourn. Horror has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? 
So why is the healing of my dear people not come about? If my head were a flowing stream, my eyes a fountain of tears, he says, I would weep day and night over the slain of my dear people. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And so this seems like the right time for us to ask one another, do we ever weep over the people we know who are lost in need of a Savior? I, I can't answer that on your behalf. I won't even try, but I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm asking the Lord God to soften my heart. God, would you soften my heart for the people who perhaps I have overlooked recently, people who I've made some assumptions about, who don't know God's grace, who don't know God's salvation in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. Listen, when you think about Jeremiah, I don't want you just to put him in this category of, oh man, he's just this bleeding heart kind of a guy. Yeah, that was part of who he was. But listen to me, there were times where this man also just wanted to throw in the towel. Like he just wanted to give up. And quite honestly, uh, I think he had some good reasons for maybe giving up. Um, you, you look at some of the things the Lord uh, says to him. God told him, hey, hey, bro, don't get married. I'm not going to allow you to ever get married. Well, thanks, God. Which that also means now no children. I'm not going to be able to enjoy that. I'm not going to be able to be a grandpa, all those things. If you read the whole book, you'll discover he basically only had one friend, a guy named Baruch. Like one friend. Every time Jeremiah preached that message of repentance, <laughs> you know, man, uh, no preacher wants to sign up for this. Instead of getting some hearty amens from your congregants, every time he preached that sermon, People literally scoffed at him and ignored the guy. There was even this priest, Pashur. The priest, y'all, sends, there you go, sends orders for Jeremiah to be arrested, beaten, and put into stocks. Man, you know, with friends like that, who needs enemies? The priest is bringing the heat. And yet through all of these trials we read, here is this one man who is heartbroken for God's people. Yes, he's heartbroken for God's people, but then at the very same time, he is also being so transparent to say, I am struggling with God's call on my life. Some of you understand what, what this is like. I know God is calling me. I know what he desires for me to do. And at the same time, I'm struggling with this heart. And Jeremiah says in chapter 20, here it is. This is kind of his breaking point, the camel that's about to break, you know, the straw that's, a, the camel that's about to break the straw's back, yeah. You got me. The straw that's about to break the camel's back. He says, God, you have deceived me. He's mad. God, you deceived me. Look at what it says, Jeremiah 20, verse 7 now. Jeremiah 20, verse 7. I am a laughing stock all the time. He says, everyone ridicules me. For whenever I speak, whenever I cry out, whenever I proclaim that violence and destruction is coming, God, this is what you told me to say, I'm saying it. So the word of the Lord, when I say that, he says, has become my constant disgrace and derision. He says, I say, now here he is. He's like second guessing everything. He says to himself, I, I won't mention God anymore. I won't, I won't mention him or speak any longer in his name. That's what he's saying to himself. But then when I do that, the message becomes like a fire burning in my heart. It's shut up in my bones. I, I become tired. I just can't hold it in. I cannot prevail. It's impossible, he says, for me to hold this in because, God, this is, this is what you've called me to and this is what I must share. 
And so Jeremiah continues. He's coming to grips with the reality he faces. He knows what is happening all around him. Look at chapter 20, verse 10 and 11. He says, I I hear what those people are saying. For I've heard the gossip of many people. Terror is on every side. They're saying, report him. Let's report him. Everyone I trusted is just watching for me to fall. How would you like that to be your life journey? Everybody is just hoping you will trip up and fall. They can't wait to see it happen. Everyone I trusted watches for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived so that we may prevail against him and take our vengeance on him. But the Lord. (laughs) Here we go. But the Lord. But the Lord is with me and he is like a valiant warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. And on the heels of all of this, you got to see what Jeremiah says as he closes out this section of the text. He says, God, because you are faithful, you know what he does? He says, I am going to sing to the Lord. I'm going to sing to God. I'm going to praise the Lord for he is the one who rescues the life of the needy from evil people. Man, there's a whole sermon you can preach to yourself right there. When you are discouraged, when you are down and out, when you are frustrated, when you feel like everybody's out to get you, how about you just join the worship team and start singing a praise to the Lord? A worship team of one, maybe in your car driving on I-24, maybe you're just singing to the mirror. I don't know. Just praise the Lord. Can we talk about this? We have all these great songs we sing. I am thankful for our ministry of music. And there's a song almost every one of you know in this room. And we will get in here on a Sunday morning and we will sing it. We'll even put a smile on our face because we really like the melody. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. It's like, yeah, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Yeah, Yeah. y'all know that song, right? You know it. And so we start singing it, right? All right? And we're all about it, and we mean that part of the song. But what about the next part of the song? Look. And blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I'm walking through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Come on. Like, because we're still doing this. <laughs> I'm walking in the wilderness. Y'all are smiling and you're not even thinking about what you're saying to the Lord. I know you. Like, do we mean what we're singing to God? Every blessing, look at the next part of the song. Every blessing you pour out all, turn back to praise. When the darkness is closing in, Lord, here's what I'm going to say. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Do you understand what we're saying? Do we really live this out? Even in the darkness, even when my life seems to be falling apart, are we really able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord? Come on. I feel like this song, it just goes from, yeah, yeah, yeah. to mm, mm, uh." (laughs) Look. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in this offering, blessed be your name. Y'all, my prayer is that when we sing this song, we'll really mean it. Look, and Lord, the song continues like this. You give, God, and you take away. You give and you take away, but my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Y'all, listen to me. When we see Jeremiah praising God in the middle of his road that is marked with pain and suffering, we see that this man has truly discovered that God is faithful. God is faithful. Like, I I want that in my life. I believe you want that in your life. And so my prayer is, God, God, help me, help all of us be able to say, No matter what the circumstance, blessed be the name of the Lord our God. That's the prayer. 
Now, we're going to look at one more section of Scripture uh, before we go this morning. And I want to say, this this section of Scripture has influenced me perhaps throughout my whole journey as a follower of Christ. Uh, it's, It's Jeremiah chapter 18, and this is when Jeremiah goes down to visit the potter's house. I'm not 100% for sure, but when God first called me into youth ministry, oh, I would, y'all, if you had to listen to some of my youth group sermons, you would cringe. They were horrible. (laughs) And then, you know, the preacher one day invited me to preach in big church. There's no telling how bad that was, but I really do believe that what I preached that day was probably Jeremiah 18. I really, I, I don't know for sure. A lot of water under the bridge since then, as they say. But um, all my life, all my life this has spoken to me. And so here, here's the deal before we read it. That God is using this passage to remind the people of Judah that he really is in control. That he really does have the power to both give and to take away. And so what I'm going to ask you to do in this moment, maybe you even just need to voice a silent prayer, because I'm going to ask you to acknowledge that for each and every one of us, we are like the clay in the hands of the potter. We are in the hands of our Heavenly Father. Look look at the text with me, Jeremiah chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down at once to the potter's house, and there I will reveal my words to you. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working away at the wheel. But the jar that he was making from the clay became flawed in the potter's hands. So he made it into another jar as it seemed right for him to do. And then the word of the Lord came to me. O house of Israel, O people of God, O people of Hope Fellowship Church, can I not treat you as this potter treats the clay? This is the Lord's declaration. Just like clay, In the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And so I'm asking you if you would be just incredibly honest with the Lord in this moment. Have you ever truly surrendered your life to the Lord in a way where you are saying, God, I'm yours? Where you say, God, I'm I'm here. Where you say, God, my life is in your hands. Lord, I'm not going to resist what you have for me. So God, in this moment, I'm, I'm asking you to mold me and to shape me, Lord, for your purposes and for your glory. Perhaps another part of the reason this passage is so meaningful to me is because that when I was a teenager... Uh, I grew up in an incredible church in Oklahoma that, that had big youth choirs. And uh, a lot of you know my dad was the, the music minister in the church. He was the choir director. And, and in the days of the big youth choirs, we also went on youth choir tours. It was quite a remarkable thing. You know, we would have about a 70 to 80 voice youth choir. And every other summer, we would go on a trip across the country. It was like a two-week trip, two charter buses, They would plan out all these churches for us to visit and and minister in. Life-changing experience. The deal was, if you came into the youth group as a 6th or 7th grader, by the time you got to 12th grade, you would have seen about 40 states across the nation. Because one year was to the West Coast, one year was to the Northeast, one year was to the Southeast. It it was just an incredible experience. And so... um, For whatever reason, my dad always closed out these youth choir concerts as we would go and sing with the very same song. And uh, it's a song that many of you know, but after we were done with our concert, 
uh, the youth choir who had been, you know, in the choir loft, we would come down and we would split off into the auditorium at whatever church we were in, and we would make a big circle around the outside of the room. And we began to sing a hymn that is inspired and written out of the Jeremiah chapter 18 text when Jeremiah goes to the potter's house. Some of you know the hymn. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. You know it. Thou art the potter, and God, I am the clay. So mold me and make me after thy will. And here's the part most of us don't want to do. While I'm waiting, while I'm yielded, while I'm still. That's the hard part. Have thine own way, Lord. Have your way. God, you're the potter. I'm just a piece of clay. So, Lord, today I'm saying to you, would you mold me? Would you make me? However you want to make me in accordance with your will. And, God, I'm just going to be here. I'm going to surrender to you, and I'm going to place my life in your hands. I'm going to wait here. I'm going to be yielded, and I'm going to be still. Pretty much that's the invitation to you today. You have an opportunity to uh, do really one of two or three things. To look at all this, to look at God's word and say, man, good word. Thanks for reminding me of this. I'm going to go out next week and do what I've done the past 52 weeks of the year. That may be good. That may be not so good. Uh, For some of you, God is really drawing you to himself today, even in this moment. Your heart has been softened to hear and be reminded of his promises and his truths. And he's calling you to follow him. To surrender your life to him. Or you could just completely, you know, reject all of this and say, man, that was crazy. I ain't never going back to that church. I hope you don't say that. But really, some of us are kind of hard-hearted. And it may be that this message is not even resonating with you. I hope you come back. In fact, I'll say what we say at Celebrate Recovery. Keep coming back. Because in God's timing, he, he speaks. We have to be willing to listen. So today, uh, I want to pray. And then, you know, we're going to come together. We're going to worship some more. And uh, perhaps today, you, you would like to talk to some of us, pray with us. We're, we're here. I'm going to be over here on this side. If you want to come down, I'll receive you, encourage you. Maybe that's not how you want to do it. Your preference may be, hey, can we, can we talk this week? Could we have a phone call, whatever? However you want that to go down. The truth is that most of you in this room, you know someone. You may be here with someone right now who, who is a believer. They're a follower of Christ. You see them, and they're maturing in their faith journey. They, too, would love to talk to you about what we're talking about today. Step into that. Don't miss out on that. God, thank you for this morning. We want to respond to you to be that person who is willing, waiting, yielding our lives to you, placing our life in your hands. God, this means we're letting go of all the control that we like so much, and we're going to follow you. God, may you receive honor and glory. May lives be changed. God, thank you for what you're doing in this place. We don't take it for granted. May you continue to grow your kingdom as we become disciples who make disciples. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.